I want us to talk about living with Jesus at the center of our life. Do we have any machinists in the crowd? Anthony, can you explain to us what a center punch does? It uh, gives you a place to start your dream. So it doesn't wander off. It, it makes a little pop mark in the steel. Then when you put your drill bit down on it, it stays in that spot and you can, you can drill the hole. If you don't have that center punch hole, your drill can wander all over the place and you have no idea where it's going to be. Jesus is like that center punched hole. He keeps us right where we're supposed to be. Now I want to flip that a little bit and I want us to think about how important it is for us to stay with Jesus at the focus of our life. That Jesus is the pinpoint of everything. I appreciate what uh, the, the reading of the scripture from Bobby this morning. And I, I want us to, to think about the fact that Jesus and all that he's done for us, the blessings that are afforded to us only come because of Jesus and what he did on the cross. The Apostle Paul in the letter to the Colossians you could easily call this letter the Christ-centered life or the Jesus-centered life. It's only four chapters, but yet in every one of these chapters, Paul shows us that Jesus should be at the core, at the very heart of every part of the Christian's life. Jesus living in me, the hope of glory, but then we also need to realize that if I am letting Jesus live in the center of my life, Jesus surrounds us. We are in Christ, Christ in us, all at the same time. It's important for us to grasp the concept that if we are in Jesus, in Christ, Christ is in us and we have access most assuredly, as Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 3 says, all of the spiritual blessings that are in Christ are given to us when we live and abide in Christ. In Colossians chapter 2 and verse 10, he says, You are complete in Him, who is the head of all principality and power. Have you seen people, Christians, who are unfulfilled? Whose lives are just uh, sad or displaced or they just feel like they're in a rut? Well, when we get like that, it's usually because Jesus is not the focus of what we're doing. Somehow we've gotten sidetracked into letting something else be the reason that we're doing things. Sometimes even the religious things that we do. Sometimes we get sidetracked and we, we think the wrong things are important. Let me remind you this morning that Christ, being at the center of our lives, is the most important part of Christianity. Christ-centered Christians will realize the wonderful blessings that we have in Christ. And we won't allow the day-to-day -day disappointments to get us down if Christ is for us who can be against us if Christ is living in us there's no place for the devil and his tricks to take us away from what God wants us to be a lot of times it's easy for us as Christians to look at the church and we focus our energy upon the church if a lot of people say, well, if I'll just go to church, that'll fix my problems. If I just go to church, everything is going to be okay. And that's, that's a misdirection. Yes, the church is important. In fact, Christ is the head of the church, but yet the church is only the extension of Christ's power. It is not the summation of Jesus Christ. That if we are only doing things because they are a part of the church and not because they are a part of Christ, we'll miss out on the blessings that Christ affords. 
You might have some blessings that the church affords, like the friendship, the fellowship, and things like that. But the spiritual blessing of having forgiveness of sins does not come from the church. It comes from Jesus Christ himself. Just going to church will not make you fulfilled as a Christian. Just coming and sitting in a pew and singing the songs and putting your money in the plate and those kinds of things, although they're good and although they are a part of Christianity, if that's the whole summation of who you are and what you are, you will be unfulfilled. You will be displaced in the Christian life. The source of all spiritual life is Jesus. That's why Paul will say in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 13, what's he say? I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can do all things because Christ is alive in my life. Because Christ is living and reigning and making my decisions for me. There are other people who may not think that Christ is important or the church is important. So they begin to lean on their own wisdom, what they've come up with on their own. Um, and they're misguided. I once heard a guy say to me, isn't it better for me to be thinking, sitting in my boat on the lake, thinking about what a wonderful God this God is, instead of in a, in a building wondering what God looks like out on the lake? Does that make sense? Haven't we misplaced our affection that if Christ is the center of me, of my life, I'm going to want to be where Christ is. I want to be where Christ's people are. I want to have Christ to direct my life and not my own wisdom because the wisdom of man is always flawed. You just ask my wife and she'll tell you how misdirected I am sometimes. But when you think about a human wisdom, when we just apply our own way of thinking, it leaves us morally bankrupt. And it will, it will make us think that we're doing something, but we're just spinning our wheels in, out, of, out of place. Human wisdom is vain. Human wisdom is deceptive. Notice in Proverbs chapter 14, in verse 12, there is a way that seems right unto man, but its end is the way of death. So we might devise some things that look religious. We might have some things in our life that, that look like Christ, but are not really Christ-centered. And therefore, we miss out on the blessings that Christ has to give. Even knowledge that comes from God's Word can be very unsatisfying unless a person's heart and life is wholly committed to Jesus Christ. Do you believe that? That there are some people that, that know the Bible from Genesis through maps, and they've got so much of it memorized, but yet their life is not, not full of Christ. And it's just the weariness in doing things and, and knowing. Notice that Paul tells us again in Colossians chapter 2 and verse 3, that in Christ, in Him, are hid all of the treasures and wisdom and knowledge. It's in Christ, not just in the Bible, not just in the things that the Bible talks about. Again, in order for the treasures to mean anything to the Christian is if Christ is the center and motivation for what we're doing. Even an atheist might read the New Testament. He might know a lot about Jesus. He might know the historicity of Christ, the facts of Christ, but knowing Christ is a whole different thing than knowing about Christ. It's interesting that when we use this term to know Christ, it means that we have become one with Him. It means that Christ has become 
the focus of who we are. It's like a husband and wife. When they enter into a relationship, they become the two become one. And that is the way it is with Christ. We are doing what He directs. He is the one that's in the driver's seat, so to speak. Knowing Jesus and knowing about Jesus are two totally different things. I've met a lot of people whose minds are filled with biblical knowledge, with a lot of biblical facts, but their hearts are cold and empty because they're not living for Jesus. Because Jesus is not the, the motivation for gaining that knowledge. I've been spending a lot of time watching some debates recently. Uh, the internet is a wonderful thing because you can get exposed to a lot of teaching that is great for you. If you will, do an do a internet search, especially YouTube, for a young man by the name of Kyle Butt. Kyle is, uh, he can't be 40 years old yet, but he is one of the most uh, astute, one of the most uh, eloquent speakers in the brotherhood. And he has debated several agnostics and several atheists. And Kyle does it in such a way that you just come away blessed because you, you know that, that he's, he loves Jesus and he wants to get the message of Christ across. But a lot of times when he's debating these people, they'll know just as much Bible as, as Kyle does. And in fact, they'll even quote scripture to try to trip up the, the, the brethren. And isn't it sad that you can read the same book and, and not let the blessing of having Christ run our lives? How sad that is. That reminds us that when Jesus told us, told the Jews of his day, in John chapter 5 and verse 39, he said, You search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and these are they that testify of me. But you are not willing to come to me that you may have life. Wow, what an indictment. They know the Bible, and the Bible testifies that Christ is coming, but they're not willing to accept Christ because it offended their conscience. There are some who think that just religious activity, if I, if I pray... If I take the Lord's Supper, if I sing, if I do all of these things that look religious, then somehow that will make me full. If I have a lot of good works, doesn't that run counter to what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7? He says, not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that does the will of my Father... And you'll remember in the judgment scene that there are going to be people that will say, depart from me because I never knew you. They were going through the motions, but Jesus was not the focus of why they were doing it. They were doing it maybe for their own uh, elevating themselves to make themselves look pious or whatever else it might be. And they missed the boat. A person can go through all of the motions of worship and look pious and do every kind of good work that's prescribed in Scripture, but without Jesus being the driving force behind it, it's just emptiness in vain. In fact, it can become boring. There's a lot of people that start out their life in Christ and they come to church and they sing the songs and they do these things, but they never develop a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. They're not praying from the heart, talking to him and letting the scripture talk back to us. And they build their whole thing on a bunch of activity instead of a relationship with Jesus Christ. And they become bored and they fall away. Because there's nothing to just a bunch of activity unless Christ is the main focus. Jesus is the main purpose for every religious act. That's when it becomes meaningful. Since this is the case, don't you think we all ought to stop and ask ourselves, what does it mean to, li to live a Christ-centered life? What does it take to make Jesus the center of everything? 
Well, number one, we need to realize that Jesus is the leader and we are the followers. Jesus is the leader of all of his disciples. He is the leader of his disciples. There's no one else. Jesus is not just the head of the church like in an executive capacity for some business, like the president of our United States, which I've never been able to talk to our president. There's a few things I'd like to tell him. <laughs> but I, I, don't have, I don't have a relationship with the president of the United States. But with Christ, who is the head of the church, I do have a relationship. I do have the ability to talk to him. I do have the ability to, to have a, a relationship built upon scripture, built upon a lifestyle. The church is not just some institution with a chief executive officer sitting in an office somewhere handing down decrees, do this, do this, do this. Jesus is saying, come unto me, you who are weary and heavy laden. And I will give you rest. He's saying, build a life with me. Build a relationship with me. The scriptures show that Christ is the head of his spiritual body. He's the head of the church. And his life flows through that body into every individual member. The church is not just a, a mere organization. It's really an organism. Christ being the head. And we are members of that body. Each of us has a different role to play, but we all trace our reason for what we do back to Christ. Every member of the church needs to be connected to Christ. We all need to be ready to follow him wherever he goes. I love Matthew chapter 16 and verse 24. Jesus never commanded us to follow something or someone, what did he say? If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Don't follow the preacher. Don't follow the elders. Follow Christ. And let's hope that the preacher and the elders have the same relationship so that we can emulate them as well. That's another part of being in the kingdom. If you want to have a Christ-centered life, then you have to follow Jesus. You have to follow the pattern of good works that he set forth. We need to look just like Christ. In 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 21, the scripture says, For to this you were called, because Jesus Christ also suffered for us, leaving you an example that you would follow, what? In his steps. We should become just like Christ. Point number two, we need to understand that we must remember that Christ is the theme of all New Testament teaching and preaching. When you go back and you start tracing the preaching of the first century, the apostles and those who were the first members and preachers of the church of Christ found in scripture, we find that the, the summation of every sermon goes back to Jesus Christ and what Jesus had to say and how to have a relationship with Him. In the first gospel sermon on the first Pentecost after the death of Jesus Christ, the Spirit enlivening those apostles to preach and to teach, what did they preach? Jesus and Him crucified. They showed how Jesus fulfilled all Old Testament prophecy, that Jesus was the one that David was talking about, that Jesus was the one that filled Isaiah chapter 53. They proclaimed His death, His burial, His resurrection. Their preaching was just filled with Jesus. They preached about His ascension, how He had gone back to heaven, and how He is exalted at the right hand of God, seated upon David's throne the King of kings, the Lord of lords. That's what they preached. Their powerful message on that first Pentecost was that 3,000 people obeyed the gospel. They came to Jesus. They didn't come to some organization. They came to Christ. And they set their affection upon Christ. 
Now, I also want to remind you, lest we come off stilted, that if I love Jesus, I'm going to love his church. And if I love Jesus, I'm going to love his people. And if I love Jesus, I'm going to love the deeds that he's told me to do. But it's because I love Jesus that I do that, not because I love me. Throughout the book of Acts, when preachers preached, they preached Jesus. It's the theme of New Testament preaching. In Acts chapter 4, Peter and John were preaching boldly. What were they preaching? Jesus Christ. They were even told, we won't have you preach in that name anymore. And what did they say? We must obey God rather than man. For there's no other name given under heaven by which man must be saved than that name which is Jesus Christ. And so we're going to preach Him. Let it be known to all of you people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by Him this man stands here made whole. This is the stone which the builders rejected. Going back to Old Testament prophecy. He has become the chief cornerstone. And there is salvation in none other than the name of Jesus Christ. You remember when Philip was preaching to that Ethiopian as they were going along? You know he had to be in shape because he ran along beside the chariot. And he catches up to the chariot and he hears this Ethiopian treasurer reading from the scripture about the, the lamb who was dumb before the shearers. And that, that Ethiopian says, who is he talking about? Is he talking about himself or someone else? And do you remember that Philip began to preach to him at that same scripture and preached unto him what? Jesus. And it's interesting that as they were traveling along and, and preaching and teaching, that soon they came to a body of water and the, the, the Ethiopian said, well, see, here's water. What hinders me to be baptized? It's interesting that when you preach Jesus, you preach baptism. You preach that salvation comes through Christ and you know what? They don't wait to do it. They did it right then and there, knowing that the blood of Christ cleanses us from all unrighteousness, so therefore they immediately wanted their sins washed away. And that's exactly what took place. Now in the first century, when Jesus was taught, we find that those people gladly received the word. And they were eager to follow the teaching of Jesus Christ. What a wonderful testimony that is. Point number three, if we're going to have a Christ-centered life, we must walk in newness of life, we have to be changed. In Romans chapter 6, in verse number 4, Therefore, we are buried in Him through baptism, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. The same is true in Colossians chapter 3, Verse, beginning in verse 1. If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind, your affection on things above, not on things of the earth, for you died and your life, what? Is hidden in Christ Jesus, hidden in God through Christ. You see, you've become a new creature, a new creation transformed by doing the things that Jesus tells us to do in our relationship with Him. When a person submits to following Christ, he's baptized, the old self dies. And Jesus becomes the one who drives from that point on. It's no longer me getting my way. It's always, what does Jesus want me to do? You remember a while back, the bracelets that everybody was wearing, WWJD? That was a pretty good saying. And we ought to ask that question, what would Jesus do? What would Jesus have me to do? Is really the question we should ask. Since we are new creatures, we went through a spiritual change and we start a new life. Our concerns are shifted from earthly things to heavenly things. 
We learn to have peace in our life because Christ is a part of our life. We have put our faith in God knowing that our life here is short. I don't care if you die when you're 10 or if you die when you're 110. Life is short. Especially when you get out of high school. <laughs> See, you know, it used to be that you, a week was like a year. And now a year is like a week. It's just so fast. I mean, the time from when I graduated high school till now seems like just the blink of an eye. And so much life has, has gone by. And then when I think about it is in my 50s, people don't live to be 100 very often. So I'm not really middle-aged. <laughs> And I don't have a whole lot of life ahead of me, so I need to redeem the time. I need to realize that the time that I have to live a Christ-centered life is very short. A Christian's goal then is to remain faithful to the one that we love, faithful to the one to whom we are married, Christ Jesus being our husband, and look forward to the time when Jesus takes us home. Again, in Colossians chapter 1, down in verse 3, Paul says, we give thanks to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of your love for all of the saints, because of the hope which is laid up in heaven for you of which you have heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel. We have hope of going to heaven. Clearly, living a Christ-centered life means that I'm going to follow Jesus. I'm going to live faithfully. I'm going to keep my hope on not earthly things, but on heavenly things. That I'm going to look forward to heaven instead of the, the joy that I have now, a greater joy that is in heaven. Living a Christ-centered life means that we are going to look to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Continually, really the translation means to gaze, to just focus your eyesight upon Jesus. Remember in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, he says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin that so easily ensnares us and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us looking unto Jesus the author and finisher of our faith who for the joy that was set before him he endured the cross despising the shame and sat down at the right hand of God looking to Jesus every day watching him longing to be with him Focus. Sometimes it's hard to focus. There's so many things that distract us from living the Christian life. So he says, lay that aside. Get rid of it. Put it out of your life. Throw off this weight so that you can run freely the race that is set before us. What is it that's keeping you from letting Jesus be the focus of every decision that you make? What is it that you're holding on to that is worldly, that's keeping you from serving Jesus with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind, with all of your strength? What is it that, that's putting Christ and the kingdom of Christ in second place instead of first place? Those are questions that we have to answer. And our final point this morning comes from uh, John chapter 15, where we read concerning abiding in Christ, hanging on to the vine. What happens if you turn loose of the, of the branch? What happens to a, a limb that's removed from the tree? It withers and dies. So we need to stay with Christ. Let's not be on again, off again. Let's be totally dedicated all of the time. Jesus wants us to be on fire for Him. 
living every day for Christ as if it is our last. Abide in Him and Him in us. John chapter 15, verses 1 through 4. You notice what he says in verse 4. Abide in me and I in you as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you. Unless you abide in me. What does it mean to abide? I'm going to take you back to baby Greek class. The word for, and this is how I remembered that. My brain is so strange. The word for abide in the Greek language is meno. Well, I once heard that if you raise a goldfish in a little bowl, he learns the parameters of where he can go in that bowl, and then you can take him out of that bowl and put him in a bigger bowl and he'll never swim outside of the confines of his what he knows he's still going to be in that so a minnow and a goldfish not being the same thing but it helped me remember that to abide to remain within the confines of christ don't go looking for something better (laughs) as you're not going to find it didn't you specialize when you got married I specialized all my affection on my wife and no one else's wife. No other woman has my heart. No other woman has my affection. No other woman has my money. (laughs) No other woman has anything to do with me. And I have nothing to do with other women. And you know my wife and you know that she could probably beat me up. So (laughs) that makes sense. There are no other gods other than Christ. You're not going to find someone who is better than Jesus. Hang on to the vine. I know that it's easy for us to forget. And it's easy for us to become overwhelmed by this world and to get sidetracked. Come home. Come back to Jesus. Whatever it is you're looking for out in the world, it's not going to give you any any pleasure. Your family life is not going to be what it's supposed to be as long as you're outside of Christ. Make Jesus the focus. While together we stand inside.